The Book of Jonah, Chapter 4 This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Oh, death is certainly better than living like this. Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, even angry enough to die. You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Matt, will you tell me when I'm on? Am I? Am I on? There's no way. There's no way I'm on. Am I on? Oh my gosh. I can't, I can't be on. Like the story's not done. The the book of Jonah just ended on a question. The story's not. <laughs> the story's not over. I mean, what happens? What happens to Jonah? I mean, we've been tracking with this guy for four chapters now. That's like the worst cliffhanger ever. I mean, 80s kids, you thought Empire Strikes Back was bad. I am your father. And then we don't know what happens. You thought Back to the Future was bad. First movie I ever saw in the theater, by the way. Doc Emmett Brown ends that movie. Roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And then it's over. Like, God asked the question, shouldn't I be concerned about that great city? Rising inflection, question mark. And then what? Nothing. I mean, track with me as to kind of where we've come from. Jonah was a prophet of God, meant to give God's message to God's people. God called him to give God's message to another group of people, the Ninevites, outside of God's family. Really violent, like heinous war crimes group of people. Jonah didn't want to do it, so much so that he didn't even answer God's call. He ran in the opposite direction, ended up on a boat headed for Tarshish. God sent a storm to try to rattle Jonah a little bit to say, hey, I really meant what I said. Jonah's hiding in the bottom of the boat. Eventually, the sailors that he's with are trying to save his life by rowing back to shore. They can't do it. Jonah says, just throw me into the water. This is all my fault. So they throw him into the water. God appoints a big fish and God is, or Jonah is swallowed by the big fish, ends up in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, metaphorically kind of in the pit of despair. And Jonah prays. He prays a very selfish, very self-righteous prayer to God, but God answers anyway. This fish spits him back onto dry land. Chapter three, God calls Jonah once again in the very same way he called him the first time. Jonah reluctantly obeys. He goes to Nineveh and he goes, yet 30 days or yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And Nineveh repents and God relents. Remember what Sawyer walked us through last week. Jonah presents, Nineveh repents, and God relents. Now, the book of Jonah could have ended after Jonah chapter 3 with just a little, you know, and there was much rejoicing. Yay! I mean, I know missionaries that would give their right arm to go through like Jonah did and have an entire city repent and follow God. But not Jonah, not Jonah. Look at how Jonah responds 
to the events of Jonah chapter 3. Chapter 4, verse 1, it begins this way. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. What? Okay, a couple things here. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, in the original language, could be translated, Jonah saw this as an evil thing. He believes that God has done something morally wrong. So he's not angry that the Ninevites have repented. He's angry because he thought God should have destroyed the city and all that was in it. God relented and did not do that. And he said, God, you've done an evil thing. So he is really, really cheesed. And look at his request in in, in verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, because it's better for me to die than live. I mean, Jonah seems hell-bent on dying, doesn't he? Like he's John Cusack's character from Better Off Dead. He's Lane Meyer. He's John Bender from The Breakfast Club, right? Like I could disappear forever and it wouldn't make any difference. This guy is a total Eeyore. And look what he says in the first half of verse two. This is crazy. He says, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? So not only (laughs) is Jonah mad, not only does he think God did something morally wrong, he drops a little cherry on top of a, I told you so. I said this back in chapter one, I told you so. Do any of you have the chutzpah to drop an, I told you so, as kind of the cherry on top of your anger toward God? Jonah did. And I don't know if I'd call that courageous. I think I'd just call it dumb. I mean, this guy is a mess. And not only that, if you look at that entire prayer there at the beginning of Jonah chapter 4, he uses the word I, me, or my nine times. That's right, nine times. You might say, I don't remember him using the word I, me, or my nine times. Go back and count them nine times. Jonah is still just as self-centered, self-righteous, navel-gazing, self-focused as he was in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chapter 1 as well. But it's interesting Because look at the second half of verse 2. Jonah says, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Check this. It's really important to get this. Jonah rightly outlines the character of God. Jonah rightly and thoroughly outlines the character of God. He says, God, you're gracious. This word gracious is only used to describe God in the Old Testament, and it means God's promises or God's blessing, God's favor when we don't deserve it. He uses the word merciful, and it means that God is soft like a womb. He says that God is slow to anger. This speaks to God's forbearance and patience. He says God is abounding in steadfast love. The original language, that word is chesed, and we don't really have an English word for it. It means God's unrelenting love or his loyal love, his covenant love. I said God relents from disaster. This speaks to God's agonizing compassion. It, 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 it takes something out of God to show compassion. He agonizes over it, and yet he does still show compassion. So Jonah was right about God. In fact, Jonah was so right about God that he actually correctly predicted God's actions towards Nineveh. He knew God's character so well that he foresaw God's response to the Ninevites. But though he knew the right answers, he had the wrong heart posture. He could answer the questions correctly, but he couldn't get his life corrected. What a sad moment this is to know God here, but not in here. And you might have heard that final verse and wondered kind of what is meant by the Ninevites can't tell their right hand from their left. Do they just not know right and left yet? No, it's kind of a euphemism that says that they were ignorant of God in their culture. Are they still morally responsible for their actions? Sure, but they're ignorant of God in their culture. Contrast that with Jonah. Jonah is the opposite of ignorant of God. He grew up with God. He is a prophet of God. He knew God's character well, but he misses out completely on knowing God personally. What a shame. 
It brings us to kind of our first takeaway from Jonah chapter four, and here it is. It's kind of sad, to be honest with you. It's possible to know God intellectually, but not experientially. I've heard it said before that the six inches uh, of movement between your head to your heart can feel like an eternity for many of us. Jonah's self-righteousness, his selfishness, his hardcore nationalism, his desire to protect his own people, his desire for comfort, his desire for all kinds of things are trumping his ability to know God experientially. And he tells himself, it's okay, God, I know you here, but I don't need to know you in here. You might wonder, you know, how do I know if if I just know God intellectually? I know the right answers, but I don't know God in here. Here's the litmus test, ready? When you know God experientially, it changes you. When you know God, experientially, it changes you. This is why uh, our little graphic for the Jonah series is a butterfly. You were once a little caterpillar, and then you went into the cocoon of experiencing God's mercy, and you came out a totally and completely substantively different thing. There is a metamorphosis that happens in the way you view yourself, the way you view others, the way you view life. When you experience the power of God's mercy, it changes you. All over the place in the New Testament, Jesus tells stories and parables about the ways in which those who experience the mercy of others are are necessarily changed and extend mercy themselves. You may have heard of Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell is actually from here in Southern Ontario. He's a New York Times bestseller. He wrote a book called The Outliers, David and Goliath. I've actually quoted him before in in some of my sermons. I really enjoy Malcolm Gladwell's stuff. Well, if you don't know this, Malcolm Gladwell grew up in a household of faith, uh, but eventually kind of left his Christian faith behind. For a time, he would would call himself a Christian, and and then he made a choice to, to kind of leave that faith behind. And he would say that his siblings and his parents stuck with it, but for him, he was interested in things that were quantifiable, measurable. He needed metrics, and he didn't necessarily see the power of God as something you could measure. He was right. It's not something you can measure, but it is something you can experience. So in his research for a book called David and Goliath, Uh, Malcolm Gladwell interviewed a couple named Cliff and Wilma Dirksen. The Dirksons uh, had lost their daughter, Candace, uh, in a tragic, tragic situation. Candace disappeared from their home one day, and a week later, she was found about a quarter mile from their house in a hut in the woods. She had been bound, gagged, raped, and murdered. Just after Uh, They had found uh, Candace in the woods. The Dirksons were interviewed during a press conference, and they were asked this question. How do you feel about whoever did this to Candace? How do you feel? I know if somebody did that to my daughter, I, I, I couldn't put those feelings into words. None of them would be positive. Listen to how Cliff and Wilma Dirksen respond responded. Cliff said this, we would like to know who the person or persons are so that we could share, hopefully, a love that seems to be missing in these people's lives. What? Wilma responded this way, our main concern was to find Candace. We found her. I can't say at this point I forgive the person. In an article recently published in Relevant Magazine, uh, Malcolm Gladwell says that Wilma's emphasis was on that phrase, at this point. She already had an eye towards forgiveness in the 24 hours after finding her daughter dead in the woods. 
Gladwell talks about how powerful that experience was, namely how powerful it was that these two people of faith, Cliff and Wilma Dirksen, who knew the mercy of God experientially, were able to extend it to somebody else, someone who had committed a crime much like the Ninevites committed. And Gladwell writes this. He says, I have grasped the logic of the Christian faith. What I have had a hard time seeing is God's power. I put that sentence in the past tense because something happened to me when I sat in Wilma Dirksen's garden. It was one thing to read in a history book about people empowered by their faith, but it is quite another to meet an otherwise very ordinary person in the backyard of a very ordinary house who has managed to do something utterly extraordinary. Their daughter was murdered, and the first thing that Dirksons did was to stand up at the press conference and talk about the path to forgiveness. Malcolm Gladwell would now say, I'm a Christian. And it was because of that moment with Cliff and Wilma Dirksen experiencing the power of God's mercy. And here, it changes you. It makes you different. And Jonah hasn't got there yet. Now, what about you? What about you? Do you just know God in here or do you know him in here? Has it truly changed you? Because that's the power of God's mercy. It's a transforming, metamorphosis, caterpillar into butterfly type of power. Now, if I were God, I'd be done with this reluctant prophet, wouldn't you? He's full of disobedience, backtalk, rebellion, and snarky remarks. I mean, sometimes God asks him questions or commands him to do things. He doesn't even dignify it with the response. It's been over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I'd be done, but not God. God doesn't do that. Look how God responds to Jonah in verse 4. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? (laughs) <laughs> I love this response. I, I, it's just so tender to me, right? I, I hear in my mind the parent in the grocery store who has the two-year-old that's throwing like a cataclysmic, you know, throw your clothes, crying everywhere, snot going everywhere, world's going to end type of fit. And instead of grabbing them or yelling at them or getting stern with them, the parent looks at them tenderly and goes, is this helping us? Is this really making you feel better? And not in a condescending way. God's just saying, how is your anger helping us? Do you do well to be angry? And this is a question, right? This is a question. And when you're asked a question, especially if God asks you a question, what do you do? You respond, but Jonah doesn't. Verse five, Jonah went out of the city, set to the east of the city, made a booth for himself there, sat under it in the shade till he could see what would happen to the city. He he, he pouts. He doesn't answer God and he pouts. I'm going to sit in the city. I'm going to build a booth and I'm going to watch. And hopefully, hopefully uh, Nineveh's repentance doesn't take and God eventually destroys the city, and I'll be here to see it. Gosh, God has got to be done with this guy now, doesn't he? Nope. God's still patient. So God wants to teach Jonah something. He wants to help it move from his head to his heart. So the way he does it is he sends a plant Jonah's temporary shelter wouldn't have lasted very long, so God sends a plant that grows overnight and provides Jonah shade, provides him comfort from the relentless Middle Eastern sun. But then God sends a worm that chews the plant and it's just gone in a day. And not only that, he sends an east wind that blows the plant completely away. And Jonah's response once again is, I'd rather be dead. You gotta be kidding me. Lane Meyer, you'd rather be dead. God is trying to teach you something. Jonah's still not listening. Here's why. 
Jonah is far more concerned with his own comfort than his calling. Jonah's far more concerned with his comfort than his calling. We've seen that from Jonah chapter 1. I don't want to go to the Ninevites because it might cause me pain. Now he's, uh, he's upset that God first sent this thing that's providing shade from the sun and providing him comfort. And then when it goes away, Jonah first is exceedingly glad that there's a plant. And then he's angry once again that the plant is gone. He's far more concerned about being comfortable than moving towards God's calling. Jonah is blinded by his own selfishness. He's blinded by his own desire to just not have to do hard stuff. And God is trying to teach him, Jonah, my mission is far more important than that. Just over seven years ago, I felt like God called me somewhere uncomfortable to Bayview Glen Church in Toronto, Canada. I was in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's like, you know, 365 days a year and 366 of them have sunshine. I was in a church that I love, living in a home that I love, living near family and friends. I was pretty comfortable, to be honest, and God called me here. I remember uh, towards the end of kind of that discernment process, my mother asking me a question. She said, Luke, if you said no to this calling, what would your reason be? And the only reason that I could have given at that moment was it would have made me uncomfortable. And you know what? For seven and a half years, it has. (laughs) Quite a few times, to be honest with you. Are winters not uncomfortable? Good gravy. And here they come again. So has it been comfortable all the time pursuing God's calling? No. Has it been worth it? Every minute. Every minute. And listen, here's, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, be like me. Please, don't hear that. Here's what I'm saying. From my personal experience, pursuing God's calling is superior to personal comfort. Pursuing God's calling every single time, 10 times out of 10, pursuing God's calling is superior to pursuing comfort. And Jonah still doesn't get it. He misses out on the joy of being involved in God's mission because of his self-centeredness. Hmm. Hmm. What about you? Are there ways in which you're comfortable in your house? You're comfortable in your workplace? It's comfortable to not share a verbal witness about Jesus with somebody that you know? And sharing a verbal witness would make you uncomfortable? I know. Jonah knows. Don't let it stop you because pursuing God's calling is far superior to personal comfort every single time. And you know, let's just be really clear here. The book of Jonah is not about Jonah, right? We've talked about this. The book of Jonah is a book about what? God's mercy. And really, Jonah is a kind of a forerunner for Jesus. It points forward to Jesus. Jesus left his heavenly comfort to pursue God's calling. Jesus left perfect union with the Father. He left uh, his divinity and took on humanity. He left his comfort to pick up the calling of God for your sake and for mine. So, So this isn't a be like Jonah or don't be like Jonah. It certainly isn't a be like Lucas or don't be like Lucas. If you have the choice, don't be like Lucas. Rather, it's a how good is Jesus that he always saw God's calling as superior to his own personal comfort for your sake and for mine. It's meant to stir our affections and our joy in Christ. Okay, so let's finish it up, shall we? So after God's little object lesson with a plant, a worm, and a wind to teach Jonah about his great mercy, to teach Jonah that God's mission is more important than Jonah's comfort, Jonah responds once again with, I'd rather be dead. Lane Meyer, once again, I'd rather die. And God finishes up the book of Jonah in verses 10 and 11, and I'm paraphrasing here with a question question is this. 
Joni, you seem to be real concerned about this plan. You seem to care a heck of a lot about this plan. And, and it's a plant that, that you didn't bring about. I caused it to grow. It's a plant you didn't ask for. It's a plant that brought you comfort for a time. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's a plant. It's an inanimate, never living object. You're so concerned about this plant. How do you expect that I would not be concerned? about 120,000, likely more than that, people in this city that I love dearly, that I made in my image, that don't know their right hand from their left, how would you expect that I would not be concerned? And the book of Jonah ends there on a cliffhanger. No answer. Jacques Ellul is a uh, theologian. I don't agree with everything Jacques Ellul says, but I think he's got a really great observation here. He writes this, The book of Jonah has no conclusion. The final question of the book has no answer, except from the one who realizes the fullness of the mercy of God. Let me read that again. The book of Jonah has no conclusion. The final question of the book has no answer except from the one who realizes the fullness of the mercy of God. At this point in the book, I'm Jonah. You're Jonah. We're all Jonah. We're all left to answer the question that God poses to end the book. I was thinking this week of uh, the most popular children's book from 1979 to 1998. I didn't know those stats off the top of my head, but I Googled it because it was a kind of, this book reminded me of, of Jonah. The book was created for 14 year olds and in 1993, at the height of their popularity, I was 14 years old. So I loved these books. Can you, can you think? Some of you know what I'm talking about already. Choose your own adventure. There's books where you could read and then at the end of a section, you would have this choice. If you want to make this choice, go to page 93. If you want to make this choice, go to page 125. So if you went to page 93, you're eaten by a bear. Story's over. 125, you marry a princess. Wow, that's awesome. See, we're all faced with this question. This is a choose your own adventure book, Jonah is. This is not really about Jonah. It's about our response to a God who says, look, what kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be someone who has compassion? Then you've got to experience my compassion. Do you want to be someone who shows mercy? Then you've got to experience my mercy. Choose your own adventure here. You answer the question. It's funny because my, my kind of knee-jerk reaction in the Choose Your Own Adventure books too, by the way, is what's the right answer? Because I want to know if I'm going to go to page 95 and get eaten by a bear, I don't want that. If I'm going to go to page 113 and marry a princess, I want that. Tell me what the right answer is. It's fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me that on the Jewish day of Yom Kippur, the uh, day of atonement, every year in the afternoon prayer service, they read the book of Jonah in its entirety. And for them, just like for us, it ends on a cliffhanger. And immediately following the reading of the book of Jonah, they read these verses from Micah. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You see the imagery from Jonah, don't you? You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham as you pledged an oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Friends, we have an opportunity to choose our own adventure with God here. Jonah was asked a question, but in reality, we're all asked a question. Do you desire to throw yourself upon the mercy of God, to declare His goodness, to experience it in here, not just in here? This is the question we're asked, and our response is, God, you are good, 
and merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And when we throw ourselves on the mercy of God, it truly changes us. Let's pray together. God, may your mercy change us. May your mercy propel us toward calling even when it makes us uncomfortable. May your mercy renew us. May your mercy transform us from the caterpillar we were before into uh, the butterfly that you've called us to be. Teach us just a little more today about your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.